This is Musical Talk. Musical Talk. The UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Musical Musical Talk. Talk. The UK independent musical theatre podcast. Hello, welcome to Musical Talk. My name is Nick Cutts and I am sat across from Thos. Hello, Thos. Hello, Thos, who's across. Not across row between us, as you said once. Um, I'm also sat How ac- dare you! <laughs> I take that back! <laughs> I'm also sat across from Thos's doppelganger, the, the lovely uh, friend who's, who's staying with me at the moment in London, Dominic McChesney. Hi, Dom. Hello. 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 Um, he presents us with many a plum. Oh, you do? Many a plum. Oh, yes, absolutely. Your episodes are always a plum. Ah, oh, I thank you very they're, much. They're, they're rich and they always leave you wanting more. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> I'm just a pudding. Don't like plums. <laughs> you don't like? Got stones in them. <laughs> Anyway, so um, always buy a new pair of teeth. Nick, so Dom can... Dom has just returned from the Great White Way. I have, yes. And you've been to see some rather fabulous. Well, you saw one show that you loved and one show that you weren't so keen on. We're going to be talking about a show that I've thought I'm, I know you're quite interested in, which is School. No, it's not. It's uh, a Gentleman's <laughs> Guide to Love and Murder. Absolutely. Um, or kind hearts and coronets, as we call it in this country. Yes. yes. Now that's an interesting point to begin with. They obviously. What do we know about the rights situation of this? Was there a reason they decided to change the title, do you think? I've got an answer to that. It's Go just on. that it's such a tremendously old-fashioned title. Uh, coronets is just a used to be a British slang for being a member of the arist- aristocracy, and that's right. it's not a widely used term even here in Britain anymore, so I'd have thought that just doesn't have selling power. Whereas if it's playing up to a kind of sort of Victorian gentlemanly thing, then calling it a gentleman's guide strikes me as being exactly the way to sell it to a, a Broadway audience. That's only my view, though. Um, well, I've heard, and I don't know how exact this is from a few friends who are working around there, that it was they couldn't get the rights completely to the film. So they went back to the original story, the original oh. novel, which is called Israel Rank. And so the... That wouldn't sell not either. Not to say with a speech impediment. Yes. <laughs> so they've actually taken the original story, the original novel, and the movie. So the equivalent so, will be of um, musicalising the Pygmalion play yes. by George Bernard Shaw, which yes. I know that um, sometimes happens. Um, I'm aware of European tours. In yes. fact, I think old friend of this programme, Josh Boyd Rochford, explained this years ago, yeah. that there are certain companies which have um, got the rights to the songs, but they don't want to spend the extra money to get the rights to My Fair Lady, the, the screenplay. So what they do is they, they use Pygmalion and then they insert... Not very gently, I'm told. Um, and I'm doing a mime here, but no one can see. Yeah. But it reminds me very much of what you do to turkeys Fists at Christmas. Are involved. It was what you do to turkeys at Christmas. I was going to take yeah. a little bit more subtly, I'm afraid. Nick. But, but yes, they rather ram the songs into Pygmalion, if you pardon the expression. The so, wrong, uh, I'm not saying it's been done with that lack with of the wrong ending. Uh, well, you're right. There's, a, well, there's no ending in Pygmalion, mm. isn't there? It's, it oh, is yes, left hanging. Yes. 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 But you could probably make something up. There's possible endings there, aren't the there? The audience but, can choose the ending. I'm, I'm not suggesting for one second that the people behind The Gentleman's Guide have done anything quite so lacking finesse, ah. but it's but it's a, it's a well-known thing to do, of course. Ah, right. There's, I, I hadn't heard of that story, but it, it makes sense that some people... I mean, rights are so expensive mm-hmm. these days. So, But I did hear that several people were working or trying to do a musical version of Kind, Arts and, kind Hearts and Coronets. Really? Yes. Um, I know that Styles and Drew were doing one, trying to oh, do right, one, yes. I believe. I think Millicent Martin told me when I spoke to her. And a chap called John Gould, who I actually wrote a musical with, Gosh. it was one thing that he was desperately trying to get hold of the rights for. for oh, was a he long British? Time. Yes. Because it seems to be, because uh, it's a quintessential British Ealing comedy. It is, yes. And I don't know what currency Ealing comedies have in America, but of course they did recently remake very thoroughly The Lady Killers as a film, which is, you know, possibly the last word in a British sort of gentle comedy film from the 1950s. And a stage show as well, they did. Yes, there has been a, a non-musical, yeah. well, none of it's musical, but there, there has been a stage show, you're quite right, which has been quite successful here on the stage, but that's an adaptation of the original story. So it's very British still. Whereas the American version of Lady Killers, as we know, is quite a reworking. Yes. So, well, this is the, I believe, and I read the novel as well, which is, I have to say, it's very dry now. (laughs) And it's actually... It's a load of old Israel rank, is it? Yes. (laughs) To put it kindly, (laughs) yes, very much so. It has a lot of uh, points about it that you just kind of go, ooh, like one of the characters he kills is a baby. And the whole basis of it is anti-semitism so it's actually oh, really? yes when, when so, was it written 
Um, is it Victorian? I'm not sure. It's it is Victorian or Edwardian. I think it's Edwardian. I'll I'll yeah. look it up. Some or, it's old. It's old. It's them days. But it's, so it's having it's elements of it are kind of have to be stripped out or adapted. But yes. a good adaptation wouldn't be so slavishly true to its original necessarily. No. If that if the if the original isn't going to work. So. Yes. Knowing the novel and knowing Kind Hearts and Coronets, I read and watched it quite close together before seeing the show. So I had I could compare all three. Yes. My personal opinion is that I think that they have improved on both the novel and the film. Now, can I, I'm going to make a guess here because I've mm. not seen it, but yes. is it because the stage play is knowing? Because that's the one thing that's missing from the film. The film was meant as a... Well, no, that's not true. The, the film was tongue-in-cheek and knowing, but we have a much greater post-ironic sense of knowing in, in this century. I'm pleased to say, colleagues, of this century. <laughs> yes. Um, having just got my way into it. I just wondered <laughs> if that... would be the 19th century. <laughs> and also, there is a massive kind of sort of um, love of... I'm going to say the idea of Victoriana and everything it stands for, rather than the actual world yes. of the Victorians. Especially in America as well. Well, I think well, so. I think we do it here. Yes. <laughs> yes. But Some of us still do, Thos. Well, they do, and we will go into this. They, they certainly tap into Gilbert and Sullivan. Mm. In, and suddenly Rudigore, like, oh. in a very, very big way, which I know is a yeah. big uh, favourite of yours, and I'm, it's my favourite good GNS too. It's so. also the epitome of melodrama and setting up melodrama, yes. which is what Rudigore is about, not in terms of plot, but it's tonal feeling so that's very interesting well they they tell the whole thing in flashback as i think the film does as well they do eliminate a couple of characters i'm just trying to see they have this wonderful stage set let me see if i can just show you a picture of those of you on radio (laughs) those of you on radio we are are now showing things here though they have a wonderful stage set. so you've actually got well they've added a proscenium arch to a stage so you've actually got it's a bit like shock-headed peter you have the proscenium arch (laughs) here and then there's another stage which is like an old children's theatre so it's all oh, like slide in Pollux slide out. to you I believe yes, 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 Pollux yes. to you very good yes and this has all different things that flip up and and uh, it has different sections that will flip up and props will pop out and so it's not just a, it's open. not a, it's, in fact it's more of a prop than it is a set yes indeed yeah. and the backdrop is a projection screen Fantastic, funny enough, which yes. they use to great effect so does um, it match the style of the rest of the Yes, set. it does. Oh, okay. And I, because when I, interesting, before I saw this and I'd seen pictures of it, I thought, oh, is that going to be a bit weird having another stage on the stage? Mm. But I completely bought into it immediately. So, And funnily enough, here in London, it's just closed, but the 39 Steps, not a musical, but there yeah. was a beautiful adaptation of that. And of course, a great deal of the, because that's an adaptation of the film rather yes. than the book, as we're talking about different versions. Um, and that also had a musical stage. They had two boxes on either side of the stage uh, because some of it is set in an old 1930s in this case music hall in the Criterion stage which Mm. is where it is they have put a stage on the stage we had Robert Gordon on the podcast ages ago talking about Gentleman's Guide and his critique was that it would be much better written by Brits now you didn't agree with that I don't agree with that I I think because I've heard a lot of British lyricists who write horrible lyrics would fumble it yes Mm. indeed that I thought the lyrics for this were smart I thought they were clever for me the absolute hero and the star of the show was Bryce Pinkham who plays Monty Monty Navarro they changed the Jewish character from the book into uh, Italian because it's fine to hate Italians so apparently so (laughs) can we we say that yes maybe not Um, that is the unwritten text of the story yes indeed so and then is that Victorian dislike of the foreigner actually well, it I mean, is. And you see that. Yes. Let's, let's let's talk about Sweeney Todd then, because am I not right in thinking that the um, you know the 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 rival barber is yes, Italian, isn't he? So that that is actually part of Victorian well, life. Is he? Oh, but but he's a, fake, isn't he? He is indeed. Yes, but, but he's but um, the public don't know that necessarily. No. So pa- the musical comedy parodies like Drowsy Chaperone and you're Lemme talking a, about Alphonse. Let me attend. They always have those kind of. Larger than life, annoying characters that come on. And indeed, you see those in the 1930s Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire musicals as well. Some of the film versions have a, a, what can only be described as generic European fake Lothario. Yes, absolutely. Well, and uh, Misha the, Auer, the gypsy Misha, and he's, Misha. he plays the Russian, doesn't he? Well, he things, yeah. and he, you know, made yes. a career out of it. He did, indeed. you know. So, I mean, he was the quintessential. Oh, we need a we yes. need a strange foreigner character. Let's get him in. With caboodles, of <laughs> course. Yes, exactly. But so you were talking about uh, there's an Italian character who um, is the one that you give the prize to for being absolutely. I mean, uh, well, as an actor, I thought it was I thought he was superb. He was one of those actors that you just is an absolute joy to watch. Everyone was fantastic in it. They do this lovely conceit with the way he grew. 
and became more confident because he starts off as this, you know, bit of a wreck. Yes. But he, more so than I think Dennis Price did in the movie, Dennis Price already had, when you first introduced him, yeah. he had a certain swagger. Uh, right? swagger yeah. is, yes. Whereas Monty and, and Bryce Pinkham plays him, he's completely at a loss at the beginning and he's living destitute. And then as he slowly gathers in confidence his and he, when he does his want song which is foolish to think and he suddenly realizes that if he kills all his family he can rise up to the ranks israel ranks the israel <laughs> ranks oh, <laughs> but this I'm is a joke that keeps giving it, it does <laughs> yes but it was it was just wonderful to watch an actor go through all those uh, those, those choices and mm-hmm. just see it very clearly on stage they do a lovely thing which is as he changes he changes his jacket so and it becomes more and more well tailored oh, of course and so when he becomes the earl at the end he's got the perfect cut jacket it certainly moves at a pace but it's quite a long show and i was just in heaven watching the, the, it i mean it really was the title reminds me of how to succeed in business without really trying which it, is it, about it, an underdog working his way up the um, oh, yes, the, the social is. strata of, of in this case a company but it's all about hierarchy yes. isn't it so the parallels are all profound i just want to go back to this point about whether it would be better off written by a, a, yes. a british writing partnership or an american well, writing partnership well let's say stars and drew did get it yes Anthony Jew is a very, very funny... Oh, yes, no, I think they would have done a very good job of it. But but the question is... Two new fellows doing the book. But it's about the tone, isn't it? A British adaptation of... I'm going to call it Kind Hearts and Coronets, because that is essentially the the version that most people would know it as in its pre-life, would still have a very British sentiment, and it would be aimed at a British audience, whereas this is actually aimed at Broadway. Where it's ever going to come to London, I wouldn't like to say. I hope it does, but so often these things don't. Um, if we can't have Daniel Radcliffe and how to succeed in business uh, yes. without really trying, then we're probably not going to get this either. But it seems to me that it is a, an American take on what it is to be British, which ties in much more with this idea of Victoriana than the actual reality of Victoriana. And so I don't see a problem with an American or a non-British no. writing team because writing what is essentially takes, a British book. It takes an outsider to get the best satirical yes. notions. I mean, that's absolute, that is exactly the point, I think. And I, yes. I think the fact that they have done a very knowing nod to GNS yes and but that's is an bit, open door but, for Americans but that's they a do bit love it's a bit different. predictable though I mean just to go down the GNS route if you'll forgive no, me no but they don't but they, I don't think they they don't do it in a predictable manner they do it they do it stylishly and they do it well they don't do it by going oh we're going to have a rumpy bumpy song now mm. it's just <laughs> I don't it, remember when Gilbert <laughs> and Sullivan wrote one of those <laughs> I've seen some very think... dodgy productions of <laughs> Asian as been before so <laughs> you haven't seen the one I was in so. <laughs> I've heard I saw the graffiti so <laughs> um the two points you're making, the two points you're making are interesting and parallel. You're yeah. quite right. If you were just adapting Gilbert and Sullivan lyrics or things like that, because it's almost impossible to adapt Gilbert's lyrics. It's possible to adapt lyrics to Sullivan, but to use Gilbert's lyrics and then just change them almost invariably fails because actually you almost have to be Gilbert to make that work. Yes. Um, however, if you're looking for, if you were spoofing, and you've used it already, you were talking about the Drowsy Chaperone, which is a spoof of 1920s musicals. Oh, really? um, <laughs> yes, but the point is they're using what is understood to be the style the of tropes. the 1920s without it necessarily being truly accurate. It is how we remember it. Yes. What are the musical um, styles of the Victorian era that you can name apart from Gilbert and Sullivan? In this country or no, America? No, full, full stop. Just a uh, ragtime? No, not in Victorian. Wasn't that's, it? No, that's Edwardian. Oh, okay. It's got to be Gilbert and Sullivan because that's what there is. There are very few people out there saying, "Oh, Dorothy from 1897." I <laughs> yes. tell you, um, I mean, that's really about the only alternative. Really, you might just get Flora Dora in 1899. Well, it's kind of. I I think have they updated it to Edwardian times? I'm not sure. It doesn't matter in a way though because in a Gilbert and Sullivan represent Victorian musicals in some way. Even the understanding of the American development of musical theatre yes. starts with George M Cohan. Yes. And George M Cohan is actually essentially an Edwardian who's saying I'm not going to do the European thing. So yeah. it's a reaction too, but even that is 20th century. Yes. So I think there is no alternative to Gilbert and Sullivan if you're trying to evoke Victorian musical theatre. Yes. In my view, discuss. Well, they could they, <laughs> show you're working. Well, they also they could have gone down the route of music hall, that's but basic. that's later, isn't it? It's well, slightly. It, it's well, it goes. Crew. 
the, the problem with Music Hall is it's almost too long. Music Hall starts in about 1840, 1850 and has its heyday up to about 1920 and then goes into the doldrum for another 10 years before becoming variety, if you like. Yeah. That's, but the Music Hall of the 1840s and 50s and 60s is very different from the 80s, 90s and then it's very, very different again in the uh, Edwardian and 20s period. Ah. So actually Music Hall is a, a generic term for at least three different styles of musical uh, It's like classical music, isn't it? Yes, that's really. You mean it's too generic a term well, well, to be have really meaningful. Classical, then you have romantic and classical and new romantic, which is all part of the classical music umbrella. Uh, you're talking new romantic in terms of classical music and not yeah. the 1980s pop groups, obviously. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> A very ultra-vox. Yes. <laughs> and some shows that have used the music hall conceit, like Edwin Drood or, yeah. or Bell, the ballad oh, of Dr. Cribbon. excellent. How so, wonderful to know someone else who's even heard of it. Oh, yes, That's got I one of my favourite songs in it, the one where the, the Morse Code loves song. Yes, no, it's one of mine, too. Isn't that too, fantastic? Did, did, did Dodds Ladies, song. if we can continue <laughs> with our discussion. <laughs> I'm going to hit you with my handbag. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, but the, you know, the... There's a lot of shows that do use that conceit, and of they course. do come out, and they and it works it's a very voice well. Choice, isn't it? Yeah. But they never went down the route with this. They, they, but also, they, the class element yes. wouldn't permit that, would it? Although no. you were, could be classy, and uh, you know, you could be of the uh, middle class and indeed aristocracy, and go to the music hall. It is essentially a working class um, entertainment which has been adopted by society. That is, and and, and vice versa for Gilbert and Sullivan, actually, because it's light opera, it's comic opera, it's yes. aimed at the middle class and indeed an aristocratic audience. However, the working class came in their droves yes so indeed. i think that's possibly you know if you're looking it's all about hierarchy again isn't it and class but if you're trying to evoke a victorian at least middle class and higher because we're talking um, yes. members of the house of lords here yes um, an aristocratic family then it's got to be the classier end of the market yes because if you were doing music hall then you'd yeah. have to have someone coming on going i'm now gonna play yeah and then it would be more well, of a it's, stereotype it, yeah it's interesting and in, they don't do that so. oliver all the classier songs within the score take on Gilbert and Sullivan like I Shall Scream for example was that more a parlour song what do, what's your I wouldn't I don't consider Oliver to be particularly GNS at all no, um, but it's still Victorian it's it, oh yes well but it's yes, it set is. in Victorian yeah though, isn't yeah, it? it's so not. it's using musical it's using it is but it, I tell you what it is more than anything it's Lionel Bart who's possibly one of our first proper working class composers who was successful. It's a dreadful thing to say, but it's probably true. The only um, one. Well, no, no, not at all. But um, so, certainly, certainly in the second half of the 20th century, he's, he's possibly a standout. But he was, in a way, he was both a member of the working class and also strangely classless. I um, mean, you know, his best friends yes, were people... incredibly wealthy. Well, well for a while. Yeah. <laughs> not always. But yeah. Noel Coward said, I'd rather spend a, a time talking to um, Lionel Bart than any number of other composers. So, you know, he had friends in what might be called... Well, not that Noel Coward was necessarily born classy, but certainly had that air by the, by the classy. 1960s. But we're talking... Uh, Lionel Bart plugs into several things. He plugs into a kind of East End... Jewish music. Mm -hmm. He plugs into an East End working class music. I mean, and the epitome of that is Blitz, which is both yes. it's overtly Jewishly working class Second World War. And of course, he's got the umpa pa nature, which we associate with the the boisterousness of musical. We, when we were talking about musical being working class, uh, catching people from above, and Gilbert and Sullivan being middle class and catching people from below, just essentially in a thumbnail sketch. I think what Lionel Bart is doing is the first of those. I think Lionel Bart is a working class composer but, who's catching the middle but class. But couldn't you say songs like Oliver is are quite like, G you know, this great big Harry Seacon character, Oliver. It yeah, just, I understand the song, yeah. Yeah, it just <laughs> seems to have a kind of more... Does it? I've never thought no. that. No, no not, it's not... umpapari to me. That's yes. kind of, yeah. I can, um, I'll tell you what I want it reminds if it reminds me of anything at all it reminds me of the absolute musical number called Joshua which yeah, is okay. Joshua Joshua nice than, than lemon than squash, squash you are, are. <laughs> oh by gosh you are Joshua you are tell me that doesn't sound a little bit like Oliver entirely yeah. I want to ask you what was the the band or the orchestra or whatever you want to call it Don, what was that? Um... <laughs> Got told off the other day for calling <laughs> the band. He said, that's the Royal Albert Hall London Symphony. It's the orchestra. It's the orchestra. Big, the, small, impressive? I think it was... Well, it sounds quite small. The orchestrations are by Jonathan... Tunic. Thank you. Tunic. Oh, Jonathan Tunic. Yes, he did the orchestrations. There is seems to be a lot of uh, woodwind, I believe. When I listened to the cast album before, I thought it sounded like a small chamber orchestra, not... A mm. big Broadway umpy band. Umpy yeah. band. However, when I was in the theatre and listening to it, it suited it perfectly. Oh, so it, and it, it, it was. It's a very quite an intimate theatre for a Broadway theatre. Can I ask so, you a yes, question? This yes. is my, this is my favourite tunic question. I ask it all the time. Yeah. 
Jonathan Tunick is the man who gives Stephen Sondheim the sound that Stephen Sondheim has. Yes. And, oh, Well, it well, did. Mm, well let, let's, let's just go with that for the moment, but uh, at least it's arguable. Does this sound, that, because it's a Tunick arrangement, did you get any Sondheim-y moments at all? Or, and a, there's a reason I want to ask, is because I would love to hear Gilbert and Sullivan-esque stuff done in the Sondheim arrangement way and it seems to me like this could be that unless Ch uh, Tunic has decided not to part through the path which I would find very ironic because as we know Stephen Sondheim very much doesn't like the work of W.S. Gilbert yes uh, he claims it's boring now yeah. that's in he's entitled to his view I think it's a waste of an essay in his book frankly yeah. to say um, there's nothing wrong with this I just find it uninteresting well thank you Stephen so my question is does something orchestrated by Tunic therefore automatically sound at least a bit Sondheim-y I didn't think so. Good. Well, because, that answers that question. No, I, I, um, Did you know because I didn't know it was Tunic until in. later on. Oh, fine. And I'd been living with the cast album for quite a while. So I wasn't aware of it until I actually looked saw and it, saw yeah. it. Well, that, so, that, well, that yeah. answers its own question. So what that says to me is that Tunic has a Sondheim sound, but he also, I mean, we know he's very versatile anyway, but he can do anything yes. and they don't all sound the same. No, I, Which I, makes I the Sondheim do. thing even more interesting and actually would take us back to your discussion another time because actually if the Tunic thing is sufficiently versatile that not everything Tunic touches sounds like Sondheim, then actually how much of it is Tunic and how much of it is Sondheim. But that, as you say, is a discussion for another it, week. It would be interesting to hear Tunic write his own stuff. Oh, it would, wouldn't it? Yes, I'm sure is that would be fascinating. Terrible? No, I'm sure it'd be excellent. Yeah. You sometimes wonder why is he an orchestrator and not a composer? Because he's absolutely brilliant at it. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot, the, the arrangements are beautiful. I mean, the the and the great were, were, songs. Were there any knowing nods to song? I mean, any GNS specific musical moment in the staging? It was very very clear. Ruddy Gore staging. They have a scene where the character. Lord Dysquith, yes, with Dascoin. It's actually they call them the Dysquiths okay. in this. They do change the name, and the, he is singing a song called "I Don't Understand the Poor," which <laughs> is very funny. And he's got these portraits behind him. Oh, so he's in the gallery. He's in the gallery. Oh well. And the viewers, portraits, we're just going to we're going to just. Yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. going to see if I can but, find. Well, just talking about Rudigal for people who don't know it, and they should if they've been listening to musical talk. They should. Um, it's the last a, eight years. It's essentially about a bad baronet got a curse on his head. He's been cursed to do at least one bad thing a day or die in hideous pain. And if he chooses not to do so, then the portraits of his forefathers step out of their frames and torture him. So it's all about this baronet's relationship with his, with his art gallery in a way. And Fine what you're talking baronets. You could that's say. quite yeah, funny. Very good. That's extremely very good. Yeah. Oh, oh no. eight years in the waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> However, no, that is a, that's a very good joke. But but you're, what you're talking about and what you're about to describe, I think, at least sounds thematically similar, doesn't oh, it? Oh, it is. I mean, I'll, uh, there's a picture I can show you. Oh, there we one. are. And it's the it's the study, and he has two portraits here, and then a portrait of a couple at the top. And what happens is the portraits slide away, and the actors are behind, dressed exactly the same as the portrait. Do you notice them slide down? Oh, so oh yes, they drop quite. They're so like the booby drops. Yes, yeah. very but, very. But, but so the portraits come to life. They to come sing. to life to sing and they are uh, echoing the chorus that he's singing and he reacts with yeah. them and then at the end the suits of armour come to life and march as So are you tempted Thos to hop on an aeroplane and tootle off to Broadway to see this show? No I'm tempted for, to, to persuade Broadway to bring it to London Yes <laughs> <laughs> So it belongs. But, but it does sound like a fantastic show. I've not heard a bad word said about this by anyone. So. Uh, another friend of this programme, David Kingsmill, thinks it's the bee's knees. He does. Yes, yes. I, I was listening to that episode. So, and um, it is. I mean, it was very, very much me. And they have just the the costumes as well are wonderful. The chorus in in the there's the morning scene, and the chorus are all That's dressed morning with in you. Yes, it is. Yes, um, but all, it's sumptuous. It's sumptuous. Oh, Victorian, it's beautiful. Yes, it's beautiful. And everyone was in it. Was it was Velvets superb. And chinoiserie and, um, it was. And we have a summer. There's a Strallen in it as well. Yes. Well, I believe that's compulsory, isn't it? Is it <laughs> Scarlet Strallen? Yes. Yes. Scarlet Strallen is in it, playing. It was originally the the part was originated by Lisa O'Hare, who's an English actress as well. Oh, right. I do have to say the accents, everybody's, they were impeccable English. Oh, they and do. They, they did not sound like Americans putting. Yeah. Yes, transatlantic. They didn't sound that at all. And did the book have any things where you think would we say that? Or uh, no, not not at all. There wasn't anything that I went. Oh, English people wouldn't do that or say that. And usually those things stick out like sore thumbs to me. 
But I think we should say just culturally, there's been a massive improvement transatlantically in both countries being able to pick up each other's accents. Yes, I mean, I agree. you know, the, the days of Dick Van Dyke, which we still make fun of in this yeah. country, are long gone. You know, yes. there are so many American actresses who can and actors who can uh, play a British accent impeccably. Yes, and I believe. But there are a number of British actors who can play the American accent impeccably. Kate Winslet does it very well. And Hugh Laurie, I'm told. Yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Because no, the reason and Damien Lewis, I suppose, while we're on the subject. The reason Hugh Laurie plays House MD is no American actor wanted to play a grumpy doctor. Really? Yeah. So they gave it to a Brit. <laughs> Going from a show... I mean, it sounds wonderful, and I hope I heard rumours that we are getting it here, so I hope we do. Oh, goody. Going from a show that is completely British, written by Americans... Oh, I do want... We, we should talk about one thing about this show before okay. we f- leave it. Because we should talk about the fact that Jeff, Jefferson Mays plays... 19,000 characters. <laughs> he does play all the members of the Dysquith family. His curtain which is very long. Which, on the film version, of course, is what Alec Guinness did famously mm. with the, yes. the, the Dasquins. So. Well, they, they make more of the characters yeah. in this one they they actually they do make the characters a little bit more rounded and certainly the female characters which are you when you're watching kind hearts yes. and coronets i've always wanted Alec Guinness to be doing more than just smashing the yes. window and then falling from the balloon and he has in <laughs> fact a whole number when he plays um uh, uh so we have agatha Dysquith, i think and then he also plays the leading lady uh, she's a bohemian by look of it yes but well, she's an actress and she's doing oh. hedda gabler oh well why and, wouldn't you um, <laughs> now the way that he kills the characters is very funny and they lady some of them salome. are quite bloodthirsty yeah. lady salome that's yes. right lady salome salome and she's salome. playing Halle, hedda gabler and he booby traps the gun so she goes off stage and there's this shot fired and there's just all these feathers fly on stage <laughs> but all the other actors hate working with her because she's just appalling so all the suspicion falls yes. on them if it's a murder. Um, That's curtains. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. The way they use and they kill some of the characters, certainly the reverend, when he gets, he falls down the stairwell. And they have... It well? It's wonderful yeah. because what happens is he, he does the whole... James Stewart in Vertigo falling backwards oh. and the spiral staircase falls and spins behind him. Oh, you, you, so it references it, definitely. Yes, absolutely. Oh. And he, he goes back and then he falls against and he freezes and you just hear this big splat and there's a few moments and then slowly you just see blood leaking oh. out onto the... So it's a little bit gory in places and the Bloody weightlifter... <laughs> Ruddy Gory. Ruddy Gory. Oh, that would be wonderful. The way Lifter actually gets his head cut off by oh. the barbell and then it rolls on the stage and just spins round, which is very funny. Are you aware of the um, Robert Louis Stevenson book, which was turned into a very good film called The Wrong, Wrong Box, Box, which is all about all the Never beginning. Never heard of it. But oh, the, it's the, the, wonderful. It is, and that's The right. team. That's exactly right. The, the very opening sequence is about a whole... 20 children are put into a tontine, which is a kind of gambling insurance. You put a lot of money in, and the one child who's left at the end, I still alive, will get the money. And that's, that drives the whole plot. But the first five minutes is just a fantastic sequence of various children grown up dying in empire ways, you know, being stampeded by elephants, being shot through the bugle. Frozen on top of the mountain? Uh, one, one goes through a hole. He, puts the, he's, he climbs the, a tall mountain with, and he's got his British flag and he puts it in the top of the summit and he gets swallowed by the summit. <laughs> so, uh, And there's sort of uh, 10 or 20 of these. They are fantastic. And it's full of British actors like... Um, D- D- Nicholas Parsons is in it. Yes, and um, Cicely Cottledge. Yes, absolutely, that's yes. right. Uh, and Tony Hancock while we're playing that game. Oh, really? But, um, yeah, so it's a fantastic film, and it's of the same era. Yes. And um, I, now I've, we've been talking about this, now my mind is thinking, oh, I wonder if there's a, there's a, a mu- wrong box musical. There is. There is a wrong box musical. Oh, you're joking, no, is there? there is. A musical I, box. I looked up it. I looked it up, and somebody had mentioned it, connection on Facebook, yeah. not somebody I know. But I don't know how good it is, but you can buy the cast album on iTunes. Oh, it's been recorded? I believe so. Oh, how interesting. No, I haven't I, heard it. So. I may have to put my but finger it, in that little yes. hole. Yes, but it's, it is fascinating that that, uh, one hole. <laughs> that that sensibility, this English sensibility has become, you well, know, quite a bit The Victorians a... love death. I mean, death yes. is so much a part oh, of life. Oh, yes. You know. yes. What's well, that line in, in curtains? I mean, they love murder. The, the, the uh, British love murder. It's practically a hobby for them over there. <laughs> well, murder and death are two different things. The Victorians as a culture 
embrace death into part of their day to day living, well, which is the, why mourning went on so long. They had the Book of the Dead and all that stuff, didn't they? The Victorians. Yeah. I, I don't uh, know. Memento Mori books, yeah. which oh, are the, Mori, with right, the yeah. photographs of their dead people. And, and reminding that you will die. Yes. It's so much a part of it. Well, and you're right, then the, 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 the love of murder, if you like, is invented by Dickens uh, in, in Edwin Drew, which is considered by many to be the first detective novel. Yes. And goes all the way through to, well, to now. But Collins with, was the first. Well, there's, and Edward uh, Allan Poe, you, can, you, you pay your money and you take your choice, but they've all got a finger in that pie, um, unlike Sweeney Todd, presumably. But, they, um, <laughs> but you know, it builds to a crescendo in the 1930s, at least in Britain, yes. with the Agatha Christie's and the Dorothy L. Sayers. This has also, the book is fantastic. It's very, very funny. It had one of the funniest opening lines I have ever seen in of a scene, which is the dinner party scene, which the choreography was superb with these dishes being put down and picked up. There's a wonderful... It um, sounds like the scene in Betty Blue Eyes. Oh, well, I haven't seen Betty Blue Eyes. Did you see, you I see, did see Betty Blue Eyes. Do you know the scene I'm talking about? You're talking about the end? Yeah. When, when they have the banquet? Yeah. Oh, I'd fallen asleep by then. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen... Our Relations, which is a the Laurel, Laurel and Hardy, Hardy film. And it starts off with a tea party scene and they're passing yeah. and they pass plates and these the plates and cups keep on getting passed around. It was very similar to that. I think it could have gone a little bit further. But before the scene even happened, you the curtain was down and you heard this... This is the very beginning of the show. No, no, this was like in the, the, the towards the end okay. of the second okay. half. Yeah. And the curtain was down, you knew they were going into dinner and you heard this soaring... And then the s- curtain slowly riz- rose. Riz. Rizzed. I've been out of England for a long time, so my English is a little bit dodgy. <laughs> it's all right. So, but the curtain rose, and as it rose, the table came forward, and the characters were sat round the table, soaring at their dishes uh, with knives and forks. And then they kind of, like, pause, and then they start soaring again, and the whole table's kind of reverbering. And then suddenly they stop again, and one of the characters goes... Oh, this fish is tough. <laughs> <laughs> but once again, and that's where an American writers would get that, would make that work, because we may not be aware of this in this country, but British cuisine, even today, is certainly considered to be oh, yes, it's, um, Victorian, <laughs> yes. that we overcook everything, or it's mildly hard, or it's stale, or it's <laughs> off. You know, that even gets referenced in Frasier, isn't there? Where, um, yes. Whenever Daphne wants to get anyone out of the house, she says she's going to cook Granny Moon's favourite sort of rotting goat's head <laughs> dinner or whatever it is. Eels <laughs> so, or something. Yes. So, so th- that, that's a trope which we in Britain aren't really aware of, yes. but plays very well. We have some of the best restaurants in the world. We do now. We do, we do yes. now, yes. But even 15 years ago, I can tell you the, uh, the soaring your fish. Was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> If it does come here, I, which I so hope it does, I'll then first you, the queue, yes, sure you must, must see it. And I would, I would highly recommend people to get the mm-hmm. cast album as well. And if you get the chance to pop over to New York um, before the 17th of January, then I do recommend that listeners do that as well. I shall get my so. top hat and go immediately. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> um, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Going from a show written by an American team about British sensibilities, we have a new <laughs> show a point, Lord <laughs> on, on Broadway uh, written by two of the most British people in the world, uh, Lord Julian Fellows and Lord Andrew Lloyd Webber. Mm-hmm about a very American sensibility, a school of rock, which is just open to huge acclaim. Can and, I just clarify something? And here? it's uh, already come into the Palladium and go on a US tour, but clarify whatever you want. Uh, it's just been drawn to my attention that this is an adaptation of an American film. Yes. However, forgive me, and this is my misunderstanding. I will not forgive you, was there not, uh, What was the name of the American We Will Rock You that came out at the same time? You're talking of Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, right. So I want to absolutely... Because when you said School of Rock, in my tiny little head, I had conflated one with the other, because frankly, obviously you'll appreciate, it's not a genre, a genre, <laughs> a genre. I'm doing it now. <laughs> this is not a genre about which I know a very great deal. So you will have to tell me about School of Rock. I have not seen the film. School of Rock is about a fading uh, kind of down on his luck rock wannabe rock musician who um, gets mixed up in a scenario where his he gets a job teaching at a very stuffy British style boarding school. But not actually British. No. Just right. Just it, it's like Harvard or something. Yeah, yeah. An Ivy League kind and, of school. Right? Um, okay. He discovers that the kids are wonderful musicians and he lives his dreams and sets up a, a, a rock combo with the young whippersnappers. So it's about subverting class again, is it? Mm, yes, it is. Right, well, there's our thematic link. <laughs> <Okay>. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I first of all, we should say that after I'd seen Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, I, was, I only had one other show booked, which was a theatre show. Mm. Um, so I knew I wanted to see another musical and because... I thought we could talk about it on Musical Talk. Yeah. and I can think of no better reason. Yes, indeed. And Nick was like, see School of Rock. And I was like, oh, really? 
and he was like, "See School of Rock," because I'm. I have to say, I'm not you're the like, greatest. Not I'm not the greatest Lloyd rock, doesn't run rock or <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber fan. Oh, um, yes. I'm afraid, um, but he he was kind of pushing me and saying, "You must see it. You must see it." So Can anyway, had you seen it? No, no. Oh, right. it's, so it's, it's, it's only been on Broadway completely... for about a month. Oh, right. Okay. But I've seen the film and I enjoyed the film and I've long thought it should be a musical. Right. And I know we were once, Dom and I were talking about seeing shows out of our comfort zone. Yes, and indeed. And I thought there's no better out of your comfort zone than Well, this was the thing. And, and I thought, well, yes, I should do that exactly, is go and see a show out of your comfort zone because you never know what may happen. Yeah. I saw hair once and I'm glad I did it. Never seen yes. your hair. Ho, ho. Oh, but hair is the hair is very strange, isn't it? I mean, yes. because it's it's quite deceptive. Because actually, if you listen to it, it's very musical theatre. It's but, got a great but, score and a really bad set of lyrics. Yes, and, and a, a horrible book. book. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I agree. Never seen it. Um, but so yes, yeah, so I I managed to get a ticket to School of Rock, and you were educated. Yes, I. It is. I believe it is coming over here. It is going to be. An enormous hit. Of course. I think people will be going in droves. I believe they're printing money. I, I, I think that they, they the are. The sound of printing money doesn't sound that good to me. <laughs> Wait, can you see my face? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, you can't see me. The, the children are incredible. They're, they are so talented. Um, they, they can play the instruments, which they do live. They can act their socks off. They can... Sing, sing mm. they can dance. The they the absolutely time. quadruple f- threats and more. They are astounding. I loathed the show, <laughs> 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 so it's really not as a piece my of complete. as a piece of writing. You enjoyed the yeah. I just the... I'm a, I think loathed is probably Too maybe strong. a little bit strong. But what, what is the thing that stuck in your craw? My thing that stuck in my craw was that. Um, the, the, the rock songs for me there is I, one American involved in this which is Glenn Slater who's often worked with Alan Menken as a lyricist and uh, okay. he's been referred to as the next Howard Ashman for his wit uh, but I don't he, think he's witty don't agree. no I, I he's think sister I think thing. he's I think he's um, I think he's a good lyric writer but for me I don't get any wit from him I get ordinary lyrics that are very well constructed mm. but they don't actually do anything they don't take mm. me on any journey they don't say anything that's interesting sometimes if Your they do never dies. go on <laughs> if they do rhyme and they're clever they go we're rhyming and we're clever is that enough whereas yeah. i feel sondheim yeah. rhymes and he's extremely clever but you never feel like he's shoving or no. screaming that it, it just naturally or is Cole clever Porter. yes and exactly Harrison. yes my my biggest issue is that I'm just I haven't got the sensibility for rock music so a lot of the rock songs I was going I, I have no idea what they're singing I couldn't hear oh, right the diction issue and, and well it was just the, the, well, the, 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 um, the orchestra or the, the band in this case band with the band were just so loud so the music sometimes over was over the top of the um, the singing overwhelmed yes the, the songs aren't particularly very interesting there's 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 two songs there's you're in the band, which is the big moment when he discovers the kids can... Which is uh, very much like Raise Your Voice and Sister Act, which is an interesting okay. comparison to make. In where, terms of a musical group, yeah. Well, in, in terms of these kids discovering and forming this group, that they have this talent and they can actually be together. Okay. And, and they start off not knowing anything and they get more into it as a song it's a great song. device it's been used in a lot yeah. of things it's like a montage song well, I was going to say let's put on a show it yes. goes back to the start of yes. musical films at least um, yes. can I ask you a question because obviously yes. I haven't seen it I've not seen the film so the refer- I'm, a, I'm aware of the film I must say but nothing more than that um, if I was looking for someone to adapt the, the American film School of Rock <laughs> for an American audience with rock music interludes I'm not sure I go to Julian Fellows who is you an ex the two shows should have the different creative teams don't you yes I mean he's a, he, you know there's no doubting that man has an immense talent and he can adapt to a great many things but his skill but most of them involve maids and well, uh... no, but, but, but his skill is he has a very British sentiment uh, and an attitude you know from Mary Poppins onwards you know, yes. all that and uh, but that's... The, the source material a lot of the I'm guessing the best lines in the show are direct from the film yes 
so what I'm saying is, is Julian Vellows, and, and I have the greatest respect for him, is he the first person you would go to to adapt a film called School of Rock for an American audience first? And the second thing I have to ask, and forgive me, I don't have answers to this. I just want to know what your views are. That's why you're asking I very much admire Andrew Lloyd Webber. I don't particularly taste his music always, but I admire him. I actually like him when he's doing something odd. I've, I've got a lot more time for um, Stephen Wald than almost anyone else in the country. I think it's his second best musical. There we are. That's controversial, but there we are. Um, so I like it when he's doing odd things. I thought Love Never Dies was not good. And that had a rock song in it. Remember, he gets his rock, rock robots to play randomly in <laughs> Act 2, I seem to remember. Uh, allowed someone in a machine to waggle their arms through a hole or something. Anyway, that's right. Do you, I don't know if you remember that. Um, it was after the glass horse. Um, um, <laughs> so, you know, I must, well, maybe I just dreamt all this. Was that a trick? Um, yeah, it, it feels like it. Um, but the point is, he's a very talented man again. He has a particular he's an ideas voice. Man, and, he, and he once could write what I would call pop lyrics rather than rock lyrics. Um, but he's now 67, I believe. He couldn't do any lyrics. Uh, sorry, p- uh, what I'm saying. I, I'll say that again. You're quite right. Um, he's He could once write pop songs, pop music. Uh, not so much rock, I think, but pop music. But he's now 67. And are there... And this is a dreadful thing to say, but I think it must be true. Are there any great old rock stars still writing new material? I know people talk about the Rolling Stones being great, but they haven't written anything anyone wants to hear for 20 years. They perform all their old stuff very well. Is it is there a, is there a best before day on a rock writer and has Andrew Lloyd Webber passed it and is Lord Julian Kitchener Fellows the right man to adopt adapt School of Rock? Well, many people are. Forgive me for asking. Ah, yeah, no, not at all. Many rock yeah. experts in the seventies said Jesus Christ Superstar was about as rocky as a Beethoven symphony. Rocky as in like rock rather than yeah. rocky as in unstable. Right. Um, other critics would say a lot yeah. of the rock musicians involved in the show would have come up with a lot of the ideas. Mm. Um, a lot of the, a lot of people, a lot of reviews said Android Rubber is back to what we loved about him originally, which is apparently being a rock and roll, you know, composer and, and stuff like that. I think this might be a bit of mything, but go on. Well, it, it, no one knows, but I think what I've heard from the songs is that it's a very '80s rock sound mm. because the character in the film was very influenced by the kind of. You know, you'll be aware of thoughts of Black Sabbath, and you'll be aware of. Um, I've, I've read of about Deep them. Purple, yes. uh, but, but all the the real prog rock people in the seventies, the Kiss, for example. Um, the Kiss. Is, is, is that what they're called? Kiss. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe you do know more than you're letting <laughs> on. Oh. <laughs> <Young> Dom. <laughs> um, so I think he's going to that sound. He's not really doing modern rock music but no. there isn't really but no musical modern... theatre never no does it's rock more rock music. of ages yeah kind of I mean well, we were rock he was all from the 70s isn't yeah. it I mean it's a jukebox musical well, rock, but... rock of Rages is a jukebox musical yeah though, so rock of Rages just... rock of Rages yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's the Scooby Doo version yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch that Scooby, <laughs> Scooby Doo does your favourite musical song <laughs> yes I would yeah, too yeah. River. well I, I I think um, I mean music it's like Scoob it's like Scoob um I look like Shaggy when I wake up in the morning. Am I? <laughs> I, I don't wish to know that. <laughs> but I will just say this. Oh, I'm going Scooby-Doo. I'm so hungry. I can eat a horse. That's amazing. It's not bad, is it? That's very good. Very that's, good. that's on a par with your Kenny Everett impression. Thank you very which much. Which is superb, I have to say. <laughs> Hell! Well, I'll stop now. Anyway, but we were talking. You were talking yes. about rock, and you're saying that he's, he's, he is writing in rock, but he's writing a very particular kind of rock which is 80s rock and can we say the thing about 80s rock is it's very palatable to musical theatre goers because Wicked if nothing else is an 80s rock kind of show I I, I want to go back to what you're saying about Jonathan he has 80s orchestrations I think Ah, again I I want to go back to what you're saying about Jonathan Tunick is is this do we equate it and we've long talked about this on the podcast do we equate it to a rock sound because he wrote it in that style or is it purely the instruments Oh Lord! That bring it round to that sound. Well, that's not, that's not. Uh, gosh. It, well, it's an interesting thought. Can I? I'm going to take us quickly back to Hair, because Hair was considered a rock musical. Uh, you've quite a rightly, tribal rock musical. But but but, but as Thomas quite rightly pointed out, it's actually very musical theatre in its tropes when you look. But in the 60s and 70s, there was a huge drive to um, sanitise, and I use the word advisedly, but sanitise what was seen as the rock music, not just in musical theatre, but in pop uh, and the the hit parade, um, for the middle-class listener, uh, who was young previously. 
Uh, and you did that by easy listening albums. And a lot of easy listening albums are covers of the Beatles, covered of all the covers of the songs. You know, there's a marvellous time to be had on YouTube looking at, you know, um, easy listening orchestrations by Burt Kampfert of Up, Up and Away and things like that. And, and my favourite of all of those albums is actually Edmundo Ross, who's a British um, Trinidadian um, who had a fantastic um, sort of, I'm going to call it a rumba band, a Latin band in the 60s, 70s and 80s and died at 101 years old like Irving Berlin only a few years ago, bless him. Um, Marvellous man. But he did a fantastic Latin version of the hair score and it is my favourite not original score of any musical oh, and I hate hair but I do think the music is excellent and so Edmundo Ross is the man who carries me away into the world of hair in a way that the <laughs> rock orchestration go, but it answers your qu- yeah, absolutely but it answers in a way at least gives one answer to your question about whether it's the orchestration or whether it's the is there anything intrinsically rock about the song itself and I think the answer must be that if a song has a melody, it can be orchestrated in any way. It really depends if the song has a melody. Now, I don't know enough about rock to know if all rock songs have to have a melody. Um, I would say, as a middle-aged man who's getting older by the day, that that's not the case. But, of course, I'm an idiot and I don't know. So I'm not going to fall into that prejudice. But um, I can't answer your question. But it is certainly possible that you can reorchestrate things in a way that stops it being rock. Ah, discuss. Yeah. Gosh. I'm not sure I can add anything to that, really. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'm... well, there's the the thing I was most aware of. I mean, I I have very limited knowledge of rock, and I I don't I don't um, go up to meet it very very well. Mm. Um, strangely enough, the the weird thing about my musical tastes is that I actually enjoy most of my record uh, album collection is either musicals classical music or death metal is it really yes it's very bizarre but i, I can't listen to full volume but <laughs> but a lot of like heavy metal and death metal and and black metal um musicians are very classically trained whereas you don't always get that with rock musicians uh, you, or suddenly with pop music these days well deep purple john so, lord the, yes the they they're all you know they all have you know these they can Cambridge, you know if they said these, to them if you said to them play this this classical piece then they'll be like easy because they're all very well trained so they know their stuff yes um now the with with this there was a couple of moments where there was a few electric guitar chords i'm 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 kind of swimming in an unknown pool at the moment as i say these words but very well but i did feel all that sounds a little bit like the opening of evita there were a lot of moments where there was music that i i kind of recognized the out of the rock songs i didn't really what's the favorite association you made from this musical dom oh well we'll get on to that maybe in a moment but uh, rock wise i didn't leave particularly you you leave humming stick it to the man which is the song that's reprised several times Uh, and it's a good song it's fun song but it's really the only one that stick stuck in my head i don't really remember the others i remember you're in the band simply because it's been on youtube whereas the other rock songs you don't really remember there's one ballad for sierra bogus also from love never dies and and i have to say even though i said i loathed it which is a very strong word Maybe I, I kind of backtrack in the sense I didn't like it. It wasn't my sort of thing. But we knew that. Yes. But the the cast were all uh, very capable. And Sierra Bogus um, was very good in her role. Um, she plays like the high school principal. Um, she has one ballad called Where Did the Rock Go? Which was... I thought was going That's to be dangerous for the Christmas. Isn't it? <laughs> oh, well, yes, I, I, I know. That one in. Putting on a plate, but I thought that was going to have more of a uh, heart-wrenching ballad, and it it wasn't. It was a little bit insipid, I have to was say. Was that because of the instruments? If you had four thousand um, violins accompanying it, would it? Well, no, no. More... Actually, no. The song doesn't ever go high. Oh, I okay. thought it was going to have oh. like a a huge high big note belting moment but that would steal the show for her that wasn't it... yes yeah, so maybe they chose not to so maybe they, they wanted to focus on the and, children and how was the, the lead gentleman he was okay but he was just channeling he was ja- channeling jack black which is what was needed for that role because people want to see that but he doesn't come across as he's very good in it 
he gets a, a great response from it, but he's just doing a character that's very famous on film mm. already. So he kind of gets a bit of a bum deal because he, he could be working his socks off and certainly he does on stage. It's but like he's going to... Professor Higgins in My Fair Lady. It's almost now impossible to free yourself of Rex Harrison. Oh, so you are no, always so going to no, be compared. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, Even Jonathan Price. Now, they do have some other songs. They have... Uh, one number which all the kids sing which is You Don't Listen to Me which they sing to their parents there's a lot of very um, sentimental gut wrenching let's pull on the heartstrings and people in the audience go ah, 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 ah. maudlin nonsense it, they do it a lot uh, I would, uh, I would quite like to sit next to you while also, they're doing it because I'd boy, like to hear you all Thos needs to enjoy it now as a dog to come on the stage <laughs> The set is very or <clears throat> the set the set is very ordinary. It's um it's nothing. There's nothing particularly special. It's it's very kind of which, but that's perfect. That's yeah. fine. So it's not a spectacular. No, it, not at all. Lloyd Webber's not quite at known all. For, so yes. in a sense, he's back to his more modest. Stages. Oh, it's completely very naturalistic set. Yeah, it's like this is the bedroom. This is the school hallway. This is the stage. The the most spectacular set is the stage where they perform the band at the uh, the concert at the end. So it's a stage on a stage. That's right. Yeah. Oh, interesting. They they do um, um, they do have several moments where they use other music. Apparently, they have used some of the songs from the film. I haven't seen the so- the, the the film. Um, so actually, I can't say how much is of the book is from the movie or from. What, what's interesting so, is in the film, and I I believe they did keep this in the musical. That that he the. This new teacher, Huey, I believe he's called, is auditioning the kids to see if they can sing. And one of them sings Memory the, mm. in, in the film, and she sings it terribly, all flat and sharp. And he goes, Stop! That is by my least favourite composer. And I believe they've actually I, kept that I in. I do the, think they've kept yeah, but that's it in. Funny. The, yeah. Yes. But it's, it's just yeah. weird that but it's, it's just that, metaphysical. It's yeah. Which is it's yeah. really good to put it in. So yeah. um, there are a couple of things that do get lost suddenly in one of the songs. They're, they're listing something and there's obviously this very funny moment because they suddenly say something and then all the music stops and all the kids freeze and one of the kids goes can we say that and then he pauses and he goes yes and then they continue but you never hear what the line is oh. so because the band yeah. is so loud so I was like what and none of the audience laughed. reacted or laughed because none of, nobody oh, it was lost it. for everyone it was right. lost for yeah, everyone that's interesting. not just so, the British does, no, not does just anyone the British. Uh, I've got to ask this but this is a, a very uh, cheap thread to be pulling out but I'm going to go for it it's never stopped me before which is does um, I, I take it Petula Clark's um, famous song is not sung is it um, well I'm think, bearing in mind that Julian Fellows is involved a song called Downton might no, uh, no no it would be lovely be snuck in. it would have been lovely if it was they they did they do use uh, what is it you were telling me they use variations you know he used that what I call the South Bank yes so the South Bank yeah, yeah. he uses Julian, like several yeah, yeah. lines of that Julian Lloyd Webber again used it. knowing yeah. so and yes it, but I mean, he uses that in one of the it songs just seems, right, it yeah. just seems I mean the talk of the town on board at the moment is Hamilton um, and it just seems Lloyd Webber is having a bit of fun and that's oh, what good this, for him. that's what the, a lot of the critics have picked, picked up on this show and you tell it yourself it's just it's, it's people are going to love it because yeah, it is yeah. it's a popular it's a popcorn musical. Yeah, it is it is absolutely a popcorn musical. It's I mean, <laughs> they do use. But the thing is, for me, yes, yeah. <laughs> the the thing for me is that I go. I went out remembering other people's tunes. So and they use the Queen of the Night quite a lot, and it's the most Knowingly, spectacular. Not, yes, yeah, they use it very obviously. Yeah. The kids all play it on the instruments, and Sienna Bog- Boggis um, sings mm-hmm. it. Um, and then in when they're doing the 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 finale the interesting thing was they played this rock tune and then suddenly they played Queen of the Night mm. and everybody goes crazy and it's like well suddenly people are actually going more crazy and having more fun with the Mozart mm. um, but the big one for me they have a song which is I thought well this is probably going to I, I expected with the Nine Hundred Lloyd Webber show for me there'd probably be like one musical theatre yeah. in Comedy Spe- in in yeah. speech marks uh, moment and song which I would probably enjoy. I I am a big fan of By Jeeves. I do like oh, By Jeeves. Jeeves. I think that's quite a fun show. Um, and I I find when he writes very strict songs with good lyrics, they're usually really great yeah. and they have good tunes and all the rest of it. Um, 
And there's this song that introduces the school, which is called Horace Green School. And it's all, here at Horace Green, we... Ba, 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 ba. And I'm sing- beginning to sing the song that it reminds me of, oh, which okay. is the music to the 1983 uh, Woolworths Christmas adverts. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. No, I, 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 this is going to sound really stupid, but it, obviously we had a very similar childhood. The 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 nineteen eighties Christmas ad that uh, stuck in my memory is Boots. Boots. Oh, really? I don't remember that one, but oh, I'm sure. But it's it, but no, it, none stuck in my memory. Woolworth, <laughs> the Woolworth one was was always like three minutes long, and it had well, like I, every star. I've known seen the one with the time. marching band. Yes, it's not that one. It's the. I think it's the Alice in Wonderland one. Oh, I might have got I the year seen. wrong, but it is. It's. Here it at Woolworths. Da 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 da. But I, 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 I want to and ask it, you, it Thos, <laughs> jingles do lodge in the brain, do they it's, not? I, yes. I, I want to and ask you, Thos, the the hit the Here at Horace Green song does this. Here at Horace Green, we something something something. So they he does. I I don't like it, and I don't know if Hang's it's lyrics on the end. You know, yeah, and then it, puts, I but, don't know if it's Glenn or Andrew, but the, he ends a phrase, a musical phrase, in the middle of a sentence, and it that just seems. Well, actually, you know, I quite like that. You wouldn't want every song to be like that. But actually, I'll tell I you what... I don't want any song to be like well, that. Well, no, but I'll tell you what that says to me. That says, um, I'm going to use an American term, elementary school song. That says nursery school song, songs that you sing at school. It's a principle that's very singing. true. Yeah, but, but yeah. The, they're the... Humble no, it's not about, it's all the kids. Oh, OK. And yeah. all the, um, it's all the kids to sing yeah. it. It's the school song, so. so... I'm not... You know, if just the way you've sung it, and forgive me, there's no uh, question about your quality of singing there, but... Um, but it, it does, was terrible. But, yeah, but it sounds like the kind of song and the way that you sing it when you're ten. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so they they, they then go back and sing it, or the teachers sing yeah. it with a comedy, um, more comedy lyrics. Yeah. So I'm probably going to listen to a Woolworth song, and it's going to seem <laughs> nothing like. Yeah. The, well, no, but this, this sometimes a memory but, can. Yeah. But to be reminded of something only means a resonance. It doesn't mean copying. I mean, yes. we have to be very careful here. Oh I mean, yes, no, that's you know, very true. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's and and familiarity also is uh, a great device to use in, yeah. in musical theatre so I mean um, yeah. and it happens everywhere I yeah. mean um, we all know um, Don't Tell Mama from um, Cabaret. Cabaret from Cabaret um, I want and it's all once again, hearts and cabarets yes hey, but yeah. it's um, funny enough it reminds me very very much of a Duke Ellington song from the 1940s called um, Albatross um, and the reason I know that is because I have an easy listening version of it from the 1960s and 70s, which has completely... Re- band. Well, no, but it's played very, very differently to the Duke Ellington, who's a sort of, you know, he's a jazz master, isn't he? Um, and a big band man, whereas this is a more sort of Alan Chu kind of session performers kind of band. It's absolutely charming, but it just makes you think about the song in a very different way. And I discovered that all the lyrics to Don't Tell Mama fit into it. Now, I'm not saying there's any connection. It's only a resonance. Yes. But I do have a very strong resonance between one and the other and so I think that's perfectly you know people are very quick to criticise people were doing it with Lionel Bart all the time well he he did the famous one which is uh, things exactly. aren't what they, what they used, used to be, be is mountain greenery it or is indeed, very yeah. similar to mountain green and I had a um, a friend quite a long time ago who was in Blitz oh yes and she said that while they were rehearsing they suddenly realised that they ne- needed mm. another song and they said to Lionel we need another song for the women and he went away that night and then he came back the next day and he went, here's the song, blah, 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 yeah. blah. And someone went, but Lionel, that's from the musical that was showing on TV or on uh, so and so. And he's like, oh, no, shut up. Oh, really? <laughs> you play. Well, I mean, no, I, I don't I, know. But, but, they have, but forgive me, well, there's a famous one, isn't there, between um, Cole Porter wrote a, a song called... Um, the song "Make 'Em Laugh" in "Singing in the Rain" oh, is the same as "Be a, be a Clown." clown. Yeah. Yes, you know, there's, there's, there's and, a million of them. And also, yes. I mean, I... I um, when is the this is going out before your, your quiz. Quiz, quiz one isn't it well this yeah no we said this is going out uh, in yeah, February okay. um, I mean a couple of weeks ago you played the song I wrote which was a, a reference a, a homage or yeah. whatever of, of That's Entertainment and so you, and also Comedy Tonight I would have said yeah, yeah. yeah. you are able to put those little tricks in and that's um Lloyd Webber does it by quoting, literally quoting rock songs that appeared in the film and School of Rock, like dirt yeah. riffs and da 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 da. Yes, which you'll recognise as a Led Zeppelin riff, of course. Absolutely, that's <laughs> right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Why? Yes, of course. 
<laughs> you have all their hit songs. Well, and, and, and it also, pencil, it also gives a, an interesting question, which is, you know, are we getting to a stage now where we can we can't help ourselves linking everything we hear to something else so that's a that that's is a, a very question for point. another episode but it's I a think. fantastic yeah. question yes. yeah so i mean well, i do all oh, uh, one of your other questions which i want to go about about the book with julian yes. fellows is that uh, actually the book is quite good i again i don't know how much was taken from the movie or from the film sorry i've been in america <laughs> Um, but <laughs> but also, home, but you wouldn't, yeah, <laughs> yes. But um, you you wouldn't think that he is the obvious choice. But then he is a book writer. He is a he yeah. writes screenplays, and I think he's one of those characters because he's so uh, such a wonderful character yeah, in, his you, right. in his own right. You automatically are assuming that yes. he can only write what he appears as. We pigeonhole him in the same way we pigeonhole everyone and we're wrong to do so. Yes, exactly. Right. And because, you know, he is not, he's, he's a writer and just because he... He's doing his job. Yes, he's also we, a populist and we always forget that because although these programmes and these I things... Along with Andrew. Are, oh, yes, sorry. they are, but, but that's what makes them highly, you know, the answer to the question, is he the right person? Well, the question might be, the answer might be yes because actually he, he has found... A popular strain, which we think of as being the sort of the genti, uh, gentry and the genteel arist aristocracy, and that kind of thing, is so widely used. But that, that's not the only thing he does. No. Uh, and he is about being popular and appealing to the public. We mustn't ever forget that he was a speechwriter to one of the leaders of the Conservative Party in this country. He yeah. used to write the speeches for Ian Duncan Smith. Now, Ian Duncan Smith didn't go on to become Prime Minister, but um, or he, great or popular. popularity. <laughs> no, but the attempt was there. Yeah, the like, attempt was there. But the point, you know, you, you don't write speeches for your political leader that you think are going to sink and die. Mm. So, but, but, but also, he, I mean, I, I, I associate Julian with um, Gosford Park. That's not Lord so, Fellow whatever. to you. Uh, not so much Downton Abbey. <laughs> And there's some very witty line, dry and witty lines in oh, he's Gossip Park, funny. Mm, and yeah. also Americans in the in the story as well. Well, Shirley MacLaine comes over in Downton Abbey, if I remember yes, right. That's right. Um, so it, I mean, it, also remember that Noel Coward wrote um, comedies that were not, you know, he was viewed as terribly middle class, and but he wrote comedies which are a very working class basis, and Mrs. Crapper's Birthday, and and, and Burnt Oak is it? Yes, Burnt Oak. Uh, Burnt Oak is. Is, it's, it's one of the tonight at eight thirties, but isn't it the, right. the angry father who leaves home. That's right. Yeah. Yes, this is Crapper's birthday. It sounds like it, like it should be hilarious. Yes, it should be. Well, it, it's it's bittersweet. I think. And a load of old <laughs> as it would be. For an old oh, of course. Yeah. Put them dumps. I'm here all week. <laughs> so we leave on Thursday. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I I do look forward to School of Rock, but we all know I like the popular the the popular noise. I think noise. It, I, do, I do think. I mean, you know. And I think it's going to be hugely popular. I do think it's yeah. going to be popular. And the children, they were incredible. They really, yeah. really were. I, it's just not my kind of show. Yeah. And well, I, you can appreciate it without yeah. enjoying it. Yes. Yes. I, I think it's a very simple show. I think the conceit of it it works. It's a popular film. People mm. will get it. People will love the kids. People stand up and dance in the aisles, which is one of the things. He says that clenching his buttocks. Hate. Yeah. Come, everything is clenching. Um, so I mean, but um, I'm, I'm with Dom on this. So I, <laughs> it, it, I get it, very annoyed at that. Directed sort of thing. by a Brit as well, Lawrence Connor, who did, um, who's very famously yelled at by Cameron McIntosh on the documentary about Barnum, um, and he did the new Miss Saigon and the new Les Mis, which are oh, right. um, okay. playing everywhere. Yes, so I haven't seen either of those. A, a very no. British team again doing this this show. Yes. But I and, and I just think it's so funny that the. The Americans take on the British subject of yes. Queen it, Hearts. It's and... worked out quite well, you know, so... Yeah. It's, a, it's been a game of two halves, isn't it? It has, two halves. yes. Yeah. Thos and Dom, thank you very much for Thank you very much. Joining. The pleasure has been entirely yours. Yes. <laughs> no, I've had a lovely time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.